Back to Canberra now where it's all happening. Our political editor, Andrew Cornell, joins us as he does every Tuesday. Andrew Cornell, good to see you. Matt Canavan, uh, he's about to go into the uh, Nationals party room. It's going to be another doozy uh, going by what's happened in the intervening week and that leadership challenge. Yeah, yeah, joint party room we're waiting for today in terms of uh, uh, the Liberals on one side likely to raise, we want more action on climate change if last week was a guide and the Nationals to stir more trouble, I guess the Queensland Nats in terms of let's have coal-fired power stations and you know it, this is the real difficulty for, for Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, going ahead apart from the numbers in the Parliament as we saw yesterday. These are the, the two major issues he's grappling with and can't get away from. Absolutely not. Let's quickly talk about uh, Lou O'Brien. He's been elected as Deputy Speaker. Uh, not many people would even know who Lou O'Brien was but he certainly made a name for himself now in the last week. I mean yes it's a I guess an embarrassing uh, moment for the government. It's a, it's a win for Labor uh, tactically but you know I kind of think Parliament is under enough pressure uh, as it is. Over the last 10 years I mean it's really lost its shine, uh, people losing faith in politics and Labor has just really played a hand in making a mockery of the whole process hasn't it? Yeah, except it's, it's difficult to believe, I mean I don't have any evidence of this Laura, but it's difficult to believe that Labor didn't conspire with someone like Barnaby Joyce on this one. Um, the fact that it looks like five Nats crossed the floor or up to five Nats, certainly Joyce, certainly O'Brien, certainly David Gillespie and probably George Christensen and, 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 and one other, it, it's a situation, Ken O'Dowd sorry, he admitted it, um, it's a situation where um, uh, you see that Labor's just taking advantage of the split and yeah. they're entitled to do so, I suppose. And, uh, you know, the, the big mistake Michael McCormack has made in all this, if we look down at, at this situation a few months down the track, say if Michael McCormack falls in a spill, mm. is that he didn't reward even one person with even a position like Deputy Speaker in terms of those who'd supported Barnaby Joyce. He could have kept a bit of peace by doing that. I suspect the reason he didn't do that is he needed the numbers. So he needed to promise as many jobs as possible. Mm. Cynical by Labor, but sure, that's, that's politics. And yep. it, it's caused real doubts about the numbers on the floor for the Prime Minister going ahead. For, for the government's part, it, uh, the Prime Minister secured a letter from Lou O'Brien overnight which says, uh, signed by, this is highly unusual, Laura, so, signed by Lou O'Brien saying, I'll stay in the government, I won't go to the crossbench and I support the government's legislative agenda. Now, that's not cast iron, mm. uh, but, but uh, it, it indicates who only crossed the floor sparingly, which is what they're after. The, the notion of a letter, well, it's certainly unusual and I can't get an answer this morning as to the question is, who commissioned the letter? Was it Lou O'Brien's idea or the Prime Minister's idea? Can't get a question of that at the moment, Laura. Is, is it worth the paper it's written on, though, <laughs> to be honest? Yeah, well, well, that's the issue. I mean, this is, this is why I'm questioning the mm. letter. I mean, what a bizarre concept in a sense. I mean, uh, it's, uh, as you say, I mean, it's not written in blood, is it? No, it's, so it's I certainly not. not. <laughs> I hope not. Well, I haven't seen <laughs> but, the letter, but, th but that would certainly make but, Parliament but would... particularly weird this week. <laughs> I would suggest that what's happened here is uh, the PM perhaps has said and he's welcome to correct this, the PM, but the PM has perhaps said, OK, you don't have to go to the crossbench, uh, but I want this letter or this guarantee mm. that you won't just keep crossing the floor. And, and that's where we've ended up. But there are others, yep. of course, who might cross the floor. Barnaby Joyce has made that clear. It's really interesting, uh, you know, we're a year down the track, not even a year down the track for from Scott Morrison winning uh, the unwinnable election. He was the hero of the right of politics, a hero of the Liberal and National Party, and here we are. He still has not been able to mend the ideological rift at both ends of his party, on the, on the right uh, and the left, when it comes to action on climate change. On the one hand, you have uh, the right arguing for more coal-powered uh, fire, uh, more coal-fired power in this country and perhaps government support for it. On the other side, uh, the moderates are saying absolutely not and we need to be more ambitious when it comes to emissions. Uh, the ousting of Malcolm Turnbull, uh, if you listen to some, was meant to end uh, this big divide, but it certainly hasn't and is once again on display. Now, uh, what do you think about this? I mean, uh, Matt Canavan has a point, right? 
yes, the feasibility study, we should have it. If it stacks up, um, you know, the people of North Queensland need it for jobs, etc, etc. Um, the other side is also, um, to, to his argument, um, if, if, the mar if the market won't do it, this is where government should step in. But this is state territory, which the feds have stepped into. Yeah, I don't see why the federal government has responsibility for this. I don't see how it's their business. I mean, this is the responsibility of the states. Why aren't they pushing the blame for this onto the states, some states of which have privatised these things, which has created this situation, mm. then the move to renewables and then... So his argument is we, we subsidise renewables, we should subsidise this. The most interesting answer he gave you there, Laura, was when you said if the feasibility study doesn't stack up, we sort of stop pushing for this or, or worse to that effect. And he said, absolutely. Or will you accept that, I think he said. Mm. Now, um, I bet that's what's going to happen. I bet that the feasibility study will show this doesn't stack up because it will ta take too much taxpayer money and won't be worth it in the long run. And there are other uh, ways you can get power, such as gas and, and, and indeed renewables, going forward. So I think this feasibility study the whole time has been a sop, that ultimately this thing will never be built. I'd bet good money on that. Just as the, uh, I revealed yesterday, the Liddell Task Force has found that it would be 300 million bucks and uh, cause more problems and solutions if you uh, extended Liddell by three years, which, which Angus Taylor has been pushing for. So, I mean, wh what are we having a fight over here? Or what are they having a fight over? A bit of a straw, straw man, really, because the feasibility study might come back and say, look, it's uneconomic, it won't really work, it's not necessary. Well, and if the market is anything to go by, um, that, is, that is probably the indication. Maybe save that one for the tape that... Um, that comment from Matt Canavan that he will accept the feasibility study. I can't imagine he or others will, will drop this this argument, which seems like a red line for a core and not insignificant group. Well, he can run for state parliament. I mean, that's the other option Matt Canavan has. I mean, Deb Frecklington hasn't been going so well. <laughs> So perhaps he can find himself a seat there and then he can do more around power stations, can't he? <laughs> but basically, you, if you're looking to tear down a Prime Minister over what's effectively a state issue, it's a pretty weird look. I mean, look, this is a vehicle. This is a vehicle to put pressure on Scott Morrison and more particularly, and, and on what they see as the wet libs, but more particularly Michael McCormack. And uh, ultimately, uh, Michael McCormack's uh, days look... Um, uh, in danger, frankly. I mean, I don't think Barnaby Joyce will be leader again, but I think that the majority of the Nats party room don't think Michael McCormack's doing well. I think the majority of the Nats party room wouldn't vote for Barnaby Joyce. That's where you get a potential for a compromise candidate in a few months like David Littleproud. But that's mm. kind of the direction it's heading because it's just chaos at the moment, Laura. Certainly is, and that party room meeting gets underway very soon. Andrew Clonell, great to speak to you.